Hi, everybody. <laughs> nice morning, to see you. Good morning. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to start as usual with um, reading the sponsorships. Um, so the Year of Learning is sponsored by Dr. Paul Konigsberg in memory of his brother, Ed Goldberg in me memory of his cousin, Nissim Hara. Paula and Bob, and Bob Bromberg in memory of their dear friend, Julian Smith. Malka Mann in memory of her family murdered in the Holocaust. The many friends of Dr. Marvin Blush. The friends of Toby Paris. Friends of Malka Libby. Friends of Avi Gitla. Cheryl Scher, that's me. And my children and grandchildren in memory of our uncle, founding member of BRS, Dr. Israel Brook, Israel, Israel Benarav Akiva. Um, a month of learning is sponsored by Charles Gelfenstein um, in memory of his mother. And that I guess is all, and may the memories um, all have, and the Neshamach all have an aliyah. Um, what have I done? Have I turned my camera around there? <laughs> I think so. There we go. That's better. Um, okay, so um, we're going to begin again uh, with the last um, of the Psuche de Zimra share. So this will be the part four of the Sing and Sing a Song. Um, so again, I'm going to remind you that the Psuche de Zimra are the songs that we sing to praise Hashem before we, we proceed with the rest of the tefillah, which is going to be mostly... Um, the Shema and the Amida, which are the parts of the prayer where we are going to begin requesting things from Hashem. And because we're going to request, make requests from Hashem, the custom is that before we make requests, we praise Hashem and thank him for all the wonderful things um, that he's done for us. And we point out, um, not just for his benefit, but for our benefit of how wonderful Hashem is by all these different forms of prayer. So um, as we've already explained many times, um, the Psukhe de Zimra often is a part of the prayer where if you come late to shul, you often miss. And as a result, if you land up missing it, then um, the most important three prayers that everybody says that you need to say are the Baruch Shamar, the Ashrei, and the Yishtabach. So the Baruch Shamar, the blessed is, is he, which is the first bracha, remember. The Ashrei, which is Psalm 145 of David, which is in the middle, which talks a lot about happiness and all the different things that Hashem does for us. And remember, again, was the alphabetical um, listing of a prayer, which again encompasses, therefore, the whole of the Torah. Um, whenever we say a prayer that's that's got alphabetical meanings in it, it basically implies that it encompasses the whole of the Torah because all the letters of the Torah are um, use all the letters of the alphabet. And finally, the Yishtabach at the end, which is the concluding bracha that ends that section. And remember, we explained that that, that um, part of the prayer is similar to the Halal, which also starts with the bracha and ends with the bracha and hence groups all these praises, these prayers of praise together. Okay, last week we spoke about the Vayevarech David prayer which also is another prayer that, that is common to say if you have time and you're saying Pesukei de Zimra. Um, and remember, we spoke about that that was the time um, when it refers to um, ha, um, um, David had collected the money to build the temple, even though his son Shlomo builds the temple, he was the one who collected the money. And that's the time that during services, if you are in Shul during the week, obviously this doesn't apply on Shabbat, but during the week, it's a time when you will see that people will walk around and collect money um, in the tzedakah boxes in the shul. So that's um, one of the times in when you usually give tzedakah. Obviously, for those of you again now davening at home, it's a good time then to walk over to your tzedakah box that you have in the house and put um, 25 cents or a dollar, whatever it is that you want to put into your tzedakah box. Um, just like we do when we light candles or before Shabbat. Um, to cover the, you know, the mitzvah of tzedakah before Shabbat. Okay, we also spoke last week about the shiratayam, and we spoke about how the shiratayam was not originally included in the Pesuk de Zimra, but was later added because basically the fact that it was a real miracle that everybody saw and that everybody knew. 
And remember, during the praising of Hashem, most of the time we're talking about all the wonderful things that Hashem does and that we see. And because Shirat Hayam was really a, an amazing miracle, not just the fact that the seas actually split, but that even the seas closed afterwards and engulfed all the Egyptians so that they could not come through to the other side. And we really realized um, how we saved us. Another thing that we said Shirat Hayam really stresses for us is the fact that it's the communal recitation of it. Um, remember, we, we've said more and more that the communal recitation of prayer is so important. And I know that, as I said, mentioned last week, and again, I want to say this week, you'll see on every bulletin that Ashul sends out every week on the front corner, in the bottom corner, is always a, a list of how we should try to pray at the same times that people are davening from Ashul. Because again, the communal prayer going up to Hashem is what really makes um, the prayer more meaningful and going up to Hashem. Okay, if there are any questions on basically that summary of what we've done so far, feel free to ask now. Okay, then I'm going to continue today with um, the last um, part of the of the weekday shacharit um, prayers that we haven't addressed yet. And basically, those are the chapters of, from Tehillim, which are the last chapters of Tehillim, starting from Psalm 146 to Psalm 150. And basically, those are um, the Hallelujahs. Um, if you um, look in the, oh, wait, hang on a minute. Of course, I don't have my page references here. Let me just get that out here. Um, if you look in the Art Scroll Sidur, we're talking about the pages that start um, from, sorry, they start from page um, 71. And if you look in the Koran, we're talking about the prayers that start on page 75. Okay, they're the Hallelujah prayers. They all start with Hallelujah. If you remember, um, we talked before about how the, the prayer before that is, is Ashray. And we end Ashray with the prayer, with, the, with, with an extra line that's not really part, part of the Ashray, um, the Ashray, the Ashray song. Um, and that is, we ended with the So we talk about how we put the Hallelujah at the end of Ashrei to, to indicate that we're about to start all these Hallelujahs. Okay, now I know that for those of you who may be looking at the pages, you'll see that I'm, I'm saying Hallelujah as opposed to what it really says, which is Hallelujah and then yud -Hey. Because the yud -Hey, remember, is one of Hashem's names that we've discussed many times. It's the two-letter name of Hashem, where the Yud stands for um, 10, and the Hay stands for 5, which is 15. The Yud is the name of Hashem um, for the perfect world, the 10, the perfect number 10. And the Hay is the, the name for Hashem's creations of the imperfect world, of things that are not perfect, and um, that still require completion. So basically, um, that is the name of Hashem as the creator. So we, when we say the Hallelujahs or the Hallelujah Yud Hey prayers, that's what we are gonna. That's what we're basically gonna. We're gonna focus on um, during during those tefillot. Um, basically, if you translate that word Hallelujah or the Hallelujah Yud Hey, it translates directly into the word Praise God. That's really what it means. Praise God. Okay, because as we've said before, that's one of God's names. Um, however. Um, the, the RCA Sidur actually explains that really what we are actually saying for is that we're making a very happy sort of cry or song about the fact that Hashem is the one who is forever. In other words, again, as I said, whenever we talk about Hashem forever, we're referring to the fact that Hashem is the creator that was the creator before, we, before the world existed is the creator here now, and he will be the creator forever. That will, it's, it's something that Hashem is, makes Hashem eternal. And so therefore, we basically are really supposed to, when we say these prayers, use our energy and be very excited about the fact that Hashem and, and nothing else or nobody else basically created the world and is in charge of this world. And those are what we need to focus on. Um, Rav Monk, as um, he talks about the content and the purpose of these five psalms, he says basically um, 
you should understand them as songs of text and as not and not just as text but as a poetic and musical collection that actually transmits emotions works on your senses stimulates thought and also ideas that basically um, the words convey so when you're actually reading the words in english you should actually think of the thoughts the feelings the emotions and and even the stimuluses to your senses that these words actually of each of these prayers these prayers um convey um rabbi potash in his book um praying with mm, forgot what it's called praying with Come, it'll come to me. Rabbi Parakash in his book, he basically says that if you count the hallelujahs from the start of the of the prayers to the end, because they're five, each one starts with a hallelujah and each one ends with a hallelujah. So again, we've got five times two, which makes ten. And again, he said this is a hint again to the great concepts of the Aseret Hadibrot. Okay, the Aseret Hadibrot again um, attended one one rabbi. Rabbi Brana's, Rabbi Ron Brana's um, shiurim on the Aseret brought that he gave um, in last season. Um, basically, where it's not, uh, Debrot, if you trans Debrot, doesn't really translate to 10 commandments. Um, it's actually 10 sayings. And basically, you can connect the 10 sayings, again, as Repata sheds, to basically the secrets of the entire Torah. So it's not just the 10 commandments being the 10 commandments, that these are the only 10 laws that all of these 10 laws can actually be connected in different ways to all the 613 mitzvot of the Torah. And so therefore, again, the Hallelujahs represent that as well to us. Rabbi Swap says that also these Psalms, the purpose of these Psalms also are to basically crown Hashem as our king again. Remember, we always focus on Hashem being the king, being the king of the world, the king of, 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 of the Jewish people, the king of people, the king of all his creations. And basically, we, in this particular prayers, we give him the highest form of praise that you can give somebody. And basically, we introduce in the, each of these five prayers, five different themes. Okay, so the first theme that Rav Schwab says is the first, is the, in the first, the first one. Okay, which we, we'll look at them in a minute. I just want to, I just want to summarize a little bit the theme. So the first one is the Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Nafshi, Praise Hashem, my soul. So that one basically focuses on um, the Biat HaMashiach. Okay, Biat HaMashiach means the coming of the Messiah. So in other words, again, we're looking about something that is still happening and still going to happen. Okay, that's the first one. The next one that talks about it is good, means that um, we talk about already that it is the beginning of the coming of the Messiah. Okay, and since the establishment of the state of Israel, a lot of people believe that that's already, that we've already got to that second stage. We're not just in the coming of the Messiah, but we're already in the dawn of the coming of the Messiah. And basically, we actually are in the dawn of the days of the Messiah. So the Messiah is already on his way, and we're actually already starting those days. If you look at the third one, which is Hallelujah, um, it's Hashem, praise Hashem. Um, then this is the one where we're actually talking about um, what God will be like in the days of the Mashiach, when the Mashiach actually comes. And if you look at the fourth one, which is Hallelujah, um, Hashem um, El Bekotsho, praise Hashem in his sanctuary. Then we're talking about the time of when um, we actually talk about Tchiyat HaMetim. That's when Hashem will bring back um, the, the, the souls of, of people that have passed and they'll be, re, will be reunited. Again, as um, Rav, Rav um, Potash, Potash, Rav Monk and Rabbi um, um, Schwab say, it's very hard for us to comprehend this concept because of how many Neshamot have passed on and how is it actually possible in the world for everybody to sort of come back to life. But, but again, it's something that we do believe. And um, in that prayer, we say that. And then in the last one, in the last one, we actually talk about what the world will be like. In the one that says, um, Hallelujah, El Bukutsh, um, sorry, Hallelujah, Hashem Le'olam. We again bless Hashem who will be forever. Again, we talk about what it will be like in this forever world that we always talk about that, that will carry on in the future when once the Mashiach comes. And again, um, uh, Rav Schwab calls that the Olam Hanashamot, in other words, the, the world of the of the souls. Again, when the souls will be more important than the guf. 
than the body. The body will no longer be the most important thing in the world like it is now, because that's basically all we have at this time in the lifetime is our bodies. Um, um, our souls are there to guide us and to help us, but, but, but once your body dies, basically, your soul goes to Hashem and you're no longer in the current, current life that we know it. But the point of this is in the future when, when the Mashiach comes and there is an Olam Abba and everything exists, then the souls are going to be the most important parts of, the, of what happens. Okay, is everybody sort of clear about that? Okay, so now I guess my goal is now to sort of read through these, um, these prayers a little bit just for you to get a sort of an inkling um, of what they're about. Um, so in English again, and then, you know, we'll sort of see again how it focuses on each of the things that I've mentioned and sort of give a summary. So if we're going to start, I guess we'll start on page 71 in the art scroll with Psalm 146. And for those of you that are in the Quran, that is, sorry, I've got my piece of paper here with it. Uh, that would be page 75. Okay, and who would like to read to start? Doesn't matter if you've got a Korean or an arts world, doesn't matter. They're just the English. Nobody wants to do it today. <laughs> Somebody unmute. Come on, Judy, Alice, Robin. Okay, go, Judy. You go. You do the from the Koran. Okay. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing to my God as long as I live. Put not your trust in princes or in mortal man who cannot save. His breath expires, he returns to the earth. On that day, his plans come to an end. Happy is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heavens and earth, the sea and all they contain. He who keeps faith forever. He secures justice for the oppressed. He gives food to the hungry. The Lord set captains free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord raises those bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord protects the stranger. He gives courage to the orphan and widow. He thwarts the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever. He is your God, Zion, for all generations. Alleluia. Okay, so now if you can see, as again, as what Reb Schwab said, this is the part of us as we are alive at the moment in, the, in, re, in our regular living life. And we talk mostly about the physical things of our, of our body, right? In other words, and as, um, as basically um, Rabbi Schwab said, this is the time that we talk about the Biyat HaMashiach, that we're talking about that one day that the Messiah will come and then the souls will be relevant. But at the moment, it's just our bodies and our goof that has the, the values. And therefore, all the things we talk about are things like physical needs and things that we that we need. Actually, in summer, in summary, Rabbi Monk says that basically this prayer talks about man's contemplation of Hashem's omnipotence, and basically the fact that Hashem is always ready to help us, being not only you know the hungry, the the widows, the all the different things that Judy read through, but also. The fact that we have trust in him, that basically while we're here, yes, it's our bodies that, that, are, that are here, but that when we, when we do pass on and, and, and our life here is over, our nefesh, our, our soul will go back to, back to Hashem. So we focus on basically that, that part in this particular prayer. All right. So now if we move you to know, 147, Cheryl? sorry, Cheryl? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to, it's just interesting that all like this doesn't highlight all the wonderful things in the world this highlights so many things like you would look at and you would say like well i can't believe in god because there are blind people in the world and there are widowed people in the world like how can i have faith in a god that does this to the world you know but instead like it's saying praise this god that that you know takes care of these people but we know like he there are people that are hungry and there are people that are blind without sight you know and like so you're saying like it's like to remind us that it's not just for us in this world it's also for the world to come but 
I think like, you know, it helps us think that maybe we're, we, even though like we look at a blind person and think that can't be such a great life because you can't, you have, you're missing like a, such an important sense. But on the other hand, maybe there's like a specialness, maybe there's things we don't understand. So it's like highlighting things that we think are weaknesses, but they could actually be strengths even in this world. That, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's for sure. That's for sure. But basically, uh, you know, as I said, again, in this particular thing, we're talking about all this, the thing of what happens in the, in the world now. And as we're waiting for the Mashiach, when we, then, then the world will be more perfect, you know? So at the moment we are noticing that there are these things that are not good and that we can't, that don't right. work as well as we'd but like, but um, you know, we, we have but to look with them. Hang in there and have faith, right? Yeah. Hang in there and have faith. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, Alice or who wants to, Alice, would you like to read, take off your, your mute and read for the, for me, 147. Thank you. Yep. No, Alice, you need to unmute. You didn't unmute. So I can't unmute you myself, unfortunately. There you go, Alice. Perfect. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Alice. Hallelujah. For it is good to make music to our God for praise is pleasant and befitting. The builder of Jerusalem is Hashem, the outcast of Israel, he will gather in. He is the healer of the brokenhearted hearted, and the one who binds up their sorrows. He counts the numbers of the stars to all of them as assigned names. Great is our Lord and abundant in strength. His understanding is beyond calculation. Hashem encourages the humble. He lo lowers the wicked down to the ground. Call out to Hashem with thanks, with the harp sing to our God, who covers the heavens with clouds, he, who prepares rain for the earth, who makes mountains sprout with grass. He gives to an animal its food, to the young ravens that cry out. Not in the strength of the horse does he desire, and not in the legs of man does he favor. Hashem favors those who fear him, those who hope for his kindness. Praise Hashem. O Jerusalem, loud your God, O Zion, for he has strengthened the bars of your gates. And bless your children in your midst. He who makes your borders peaceful and with the cream of the wheat, he sates you, he who dispatches the utterance eastward, how swiftly he com his commandments runs, commandment runs. He who gives snow like fleece and sh scatters frost like ashes, he hurls his ice like crumbs before his cold who could stand he issues the command and it melts them. He blows his wind and the waters flow. He relates his word to Jacob. He is his statutes and judgments to Israel. He did not do so for any other nation. Such judgments, they know them not. Hallelujah. Okay, so um, thanks, um, Alice. Um, so basically, again, we see now that the, the move over here is already starting, as I said, um, Rav Shrav explains, to talk about basically the dawning of the Yemot HaMashiach, okay? The dawning being the beginning of the days of the Messiah, not necessarily that the Messiah is here, but the beginning. And it begins straight away by talking about the build, rebuilding of Jerusalem, and um you know the outcast of israel basically again as i said um we can't really consider jerusalem rebuilt or um until we actually have our temple but um the important thing is that as the the midinat israel is being established that is already seen as being the dawn of of, of our redemption and the beginning of the jewish um, redemption and so as a result we basically um we basically start to change our focus here. Instead of just, um, as Rav Monk says in the first Psalm, 
where we talk about in general how man contemplates all these different issues of the individual man and individual people, um, especially um, you know different needs of different people and of the body. Here we start to talk in more gen in more general terms about the people of Israel again, and about generally the world as a whole, um, not individuals but the animals, the the the, the land, the the water, the the sea, the oceans all these kind of things. So we basically start praising the fact that Hashem basically protects us and that he supports us, not just um, in, in, you know, physical, in the physical things, but actually by the forces of nature and by um, everything around us that, that works in the normal way that every morning we wake up and there's the sun and every morning night we go to bed and the moon comes out and, the, and the, it gets dark and we, there's a new day and all these things. So basically, that's what that we, we focus on on this particular this particular song. Okay, so now we're going to proceed to Psalm 148, and um, as I said, this now will will actually start to talk um, about um, the idea of what actually will happen um, when the Messiah is is coming, and um, how, what will, what we will be able to do. Okay, honey, do you want to read that one for me? Psalm yeah. 148, thank you. Yes. Hallelujah. Praise Hashem from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His legions. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all bright stars. Praise Him, the most exalted of the heavens and the waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of Hashem, for He commanded and they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He issued a decree that will not change. Praise Hashem from the earth, sea, giants, and all watery depths, depths, fire and hail, snow and vapor, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, crawling things and winged winged fowl, kings of the earth and all governments, princes and all judges on earth, young men and also maidens, old men together with youths. Let them praise the name of Hashem for his name alone will have been exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven and he will have exalted the pride of his nation because in praise for all his devout ones, for the children of Israel, his intimate people, hallelujah. Okay, so again, um, as we see now, that we're talking now this time about actually um, the days of the Messiah when the Messiah comes and how everybody and everything in the world will finally recognize that Hashem, as we, we say in the Shema, is one and that we will praise Hashem and everything will praise Hashem. There will be no exceptions to anybody who will have this enthusiastic adoration of Hashem. As um, Rabbi Mang says, basically it will spread over the entire cosmos, the heavens, the earth and all of Hashem's creations. And basically it's a vision this, is, this whole prayer is a vision of the future and the kingdom of yet to come. That one day all these things will be, will be for good and all these things will, will be um, in, in, in everybody's eyes as something good and everybody will accept Hashem as being um, the king and, and not just um, his devout ones, the children of Israel, but actually everybody in the, in the world will praise him. Okay, and questions on that one? All right, so now let's move to um, 149. Robin, you, you got reading or you're working? <laughs> I know you're probably working at the same time. Yeah, I'm, but I, I'm able to read. Um, okay, thank okay. you. Hallelujah, sing to Hashem a new song. Let his praise be in the congregation of the devout. Let Israel exult in its maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing, with drums and harp, let them make music to him. For Hashem favors his nation. He adorns the humble with salvation. Let the devout exult in glory. Let them sing joyously upon their beds. The lofty praises of Hashem are in their throats and a double-edged sword is in their hand to execute vengeance among the nations, rebukes among the governments, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them written judgment, that will be the splendor of all his devout ones. Hallelujah. Okay, so again, um, as I said with Rav Schwab, 
he explains that this basically is talking now about the time with the Tehiyat HaMeitzim, okay, which is the, the, the Tehiyat HaMeitzim is the, how do you say it? Um, the resurrection. Res reservation of, resurrection of the dead, of the death, dead people or whatever, which basically is referring to the Nishamot and the souls. And um, basically you're talking about a time when everybody that, as it says in this thing, is devout, has been devout to Hashem will have an opportunity to basically um, get, uh, you know, see Hashem's judgment and basically be able to, to, um, to, to come back and be reunited um, with each other. Okay. And that's a, and that's a, a, a promise of um, the, of the, fu of the future world. Um, Rav, Rav Monk actually says that this, this, this um, Hallelujah, the 149, which is the penultimate one, the, la the second last one before the end of Tehillim, basically is um, a very um, culmination of a new song. And basically it's a new song about Hashem's judgment and basically that it will free the entire earth. And basically everything in the earth will recognize Hashem as the redeemer and also um, his majesty will basically reign for it forever. So after this, basically, again, as I said, this is the time when, when we talk about all the time, when we say the Shema and we believe in the Shema, when we say it, that one day Hashem's majesty will be accepted and recognized by everybody as being the one and being the only king. But this is the time that we're talking about now when we talk about the Tchiat when the when the, the time of the reviving of the souls and resurrection of the souls will basically occur. And um, we focus on that when we think of this, this prayer. And hence, if you look at the and if you look at the end, you'll say that all his devout ones, basically all the people that have been devout, devoted to him and have and have and have followed him. And again, they all they all the Psukim that I've that I mean the past the the the, the Chazal that I've that I've studied and all the different books I've read. They all say it's not, we're not only talking about Jewish people that have been devout to Hashem, but we are talking about all his creations and, and therefore other people that have also been devout to Hashem and have accept, will accept Hashem as being, as being um, the, the only God and the, and the king of the, of the, and creator of the universe. All right, so we come to the last one, which we have discussed before. It's Psalm 150. And remember, um, we've discussed this before because you do actually say it at other places um, in the in the services on Yontif and in different times. And um, it's a it's a it's a it's a specific um, layout. It has um, a lot of of hallelujahs. Okay, the hallelujahs meaning again pra praising. And if you actually count them, you should see that there actually are are thirteen. Okay, if you start don't, not not counting the hallelujah because that obviously not, but if you count the hallelujahs all the way through, you'll see that they're 13. And again, if you know that um, 13 represents what we say are the midot of Hashem. Okay, midot translates into English more, more or less into the attributes of Hashem. So um, the midot of Hashem, which we know, um, we say them very regularly during the Slichot service. Um, you remember we say Rachum Erech Chesed. So those are the, the 13 midot of Hashem that we that we say. And um, they include all these, these attributes that Hashem that Hashem has. So by saying this um, this this um, this prayer, we actually are calling on these 13 midot, these 13 attributes of Hashem, asking Hashem. To, to, well, praising Hashem for having them and obviously asking him to show mercy on us by using these attributes. And, and basically, you know, as I say, now that we're getting ready for the next part of tefillah, which would be um, our request, we're basically asking him um, to show us, us mercy. Um, okay, so someone else to read. Alice, I see you still not muted, so maybe you read again. Alice? Yes, I'm here. Sorry, just a little bit over. 150, correct? Yeah, yeah, 150, page 75, right. yeah. Hallelujah. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him as befits his abundant greatness. Praise him with the blast of the shofar. 
praise him with the lyre and the heart. Praise him with drum and dance. Praise him with organs and flute. Praise him with clanging, clanging cymbals. Praise him with the resonant trumpets. Let all souls praise God, hallelujah. Let all souls praise God, hallelujah. Okay, so that last verse, um, the let God, let all souls pass, we can see is, is why we assume that this particular, the, this particular psalm is focusing on what we say, the olam ha-neshamot, the world of souls. In other words, the world when the souls will be in control in the future, when um, the Mashiach has come, and then no longer will the bodies be, be, be important, but the souls of, 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 of will, be, will be the important part. Um, you should notice as well, because of the way um, Alice just read it, that we say the last verse twice, um, let the souls call on, well in Hebrew, it's call on the Shema Talaliyah, Hallelujah, call on the Shema Talaliyah, Hallelujah. So we say that verse twice. And the reason we say it twice is again, well, first of all, to make sure that we have the 13 Hallelujahs. That's one of the reasons it was added. And the second reason is because of the fact that we are at the end of the book of Psalms. Remember, we explained that, that basically the Psalms that are used in this prayer are the last Psalms from the whole book of, 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 of Psalms. And as Rabbi Sachs, had, as we explained before, says it's basically the, the, the culmination and the, the, the glory of the best of the Psalms that actually end the book of Psalms. And as a result, we say the verse twice. It's very common. We say that often, um, like in lots of things that we read, when we read the, book, the books um, that we read, like Echa, we say things at the end twice. It's a very common way of ending any book um, from the Ketuvim to repeat the verse when we actually read it. In fact, it's very common when you actually do read the verses in, in say, Shul or something, is that the, the like even with, with, the, with Esther, uh, the book of Esther or, or things like that, where you, uh, usually the congregation says the, the last line themselves and then the person who's actually reading the Megillah or reading the book will actually say the last line um, afterwards. So there's usually that double saying of, of, the, of the whatever the end of the book is. So that's a very, very common way of ending off. Okay, so basically those are the Psalms. Um, of course, there's always more depth we can go into and please God, we will. Um, and, um, but I wanted next week to, to move on um, to go to the Brichot HaShachar, because that's the only part of the service so far we haven't done. Um, the Brichot HaShachar, remember, are the blessings in the morning when you wake up, the morning blessings. And that's the first section of, of the services. So um, that would be the only part that we haven't really addressed well yet. Um, and so I want to do that next week. But before I do end off today, I've got uh, two things that I just want to end with. First of all, um, I want you to know that when you are, um, again, saying the, the, the Sukkot Zimra, okay, remember what we've said. The most important point of this is for you to get in the mood and to get the idea and the feelings and the connection to Hashem, to really praise Hashem. It's really important that. So just saying all of them is not as important as really saying them with meaning, okay? And we've discussed already that in shul, if you are in shul, for those of you that already go to shul, which isn't me, but for those of you that do, it's more important for you to say that first verse and to say that last verse together with the community and maybe read in English or, or whichever you cap you good, you're good with, <laughs> the Hebrew, even if you have to do it quickly or whatever, but to keep up with the community because saying the first and the last verse and understanding the first and the last verse and what is in between is really what's important than just saying it and not keeping up with the community because it's very important to pray and say all these things together. So the, that, that's the first thing. However, there's also, um, again, if you do go to shul late, or if you don't have time to dive in as long as you would like, remember, because a lot in the case of women, that's often is the case that you don't have time because you have other responsibilities. And that's one of the reasons why davening at certain times is not compulsory for women. So um, Rabbi Barkley and Rabbi Yeager in their book, um, which basically is called Guidelines of of Tefila, they basically summarize, and I'm going to share this with you. Um, hang on, hang on, I just need to pull it up first. Let me just see. Uh, yeah. Um, 
sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay, so let me share this with you. Um, let me go back to my Zoom here. Um, okay, so I'm going to share with you this, 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 so that you can see. Okay, so it's on my iCloud. No, not that. <laughs> uh, some days it works. Screen. No, that one doesn't work either. Share content. Uh, how do I do this? It would be good if I knew. Uh, okay, let's do iCloud Drive. Uh, um, yeah, next time I'm taking a photo. It always works better with a photo. Uh, 10, 11, this one. The first okay. lines and the last lines. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. Okay. So this is the this is what I want to explain to you here. This is the oh sorry. This is what I just want to explain about what to do when you're actually saying Psuche de Zimra. Okay. So the most important thing, as the Rabbi Barkley and Rabbi Yeager say, is that you say for sure you should say Baruch Shamar Ashrei and Yishtabach. Okay. That's what we've learned in the first class, and it must be recited. There's no ways you can skip those. Okay. So you have to say those, which means. You need to you need to try and you know be there in shul in time to at least say those properly. Okay. Then interesting enough, in Rashi's opinion, you only need to say the Hallelujah, the last one, the Psalm 150, which is the one we just spoke about, you know, the one with the 13 meat of Hashem. And also the third one, which is hundred which is 148, okay which is the one that we spoke about that talks about um, the, the days of the Messiah. Okay, so I'm sorry, my, my Wi-Fi goes in and out. That's why I need to do a photo next time. Okay, so what happens is that that's the, that's the third one that you need to say. And then if you still have time, then you say the other three hallelujahs. Then if you still have time, you do the Vayivarev David, which we discussed last week. And then, sorry guys, this is a problem with my thing. I'm gonna take it off. Um, so anyway, so then, then if you still have time, you do the Hordul Hashem, if you're Ashkenazim, if you're Sephardim, apparently you don't do that. And then you go to the Azia Shir Moshe, which we also discussed last week. So those are the three that we discussed last week. And then finally, if you still have time, you say the rest of the Pesuke de Zimra. As I said now again, if you are in Shul, then it's a totally different thing. You should make sure again that you for sure say the Baruch Shama, the Ashtray, and the Yishtabach properly. All the others, you should try to just keep up with the with the chazan or the balt feel or whatever you want to call him. The chazan being the cantor, the balt feeler being the guy who's leading the services. Um, basically, you should make sure that you always say the first line and you always say the last line. And I found for myself that especially if someone's dubbing really fast, faster than what I can, which I mean, I can dub in pretty fast, but just if I can't, then I find I leave, I actually don't say the Hebrew, but I read the English because reading the English sometimes is much easier to read faster than to read the Hebrew. So it depends on the pace of the person that's governing. I actually even read um, that Rabbi Yeager and Barclay said that a, a man, as opposed to a woman, because a woman is not obligated to say every single prayer and she does, she is allowed to cut things out because of time constraints. A man is required to say that and a man should try as much as possible to go to a show whether he knows the person that davens is going to daven at the pace that he can keep up with, which is an interesting concept because that means you have to find a show during the week that you can do that, you know, for the for chakrit at least anyway. But um, again, I think the same rule applies for men and for women who are davening and especially new to davening. Um, when you can't read the words as quickly and understand them, it doesn't really make sense for you to do much else than just read the first verse and the last verse and make sure you understand the concept of what the rest of the prayer says. And you can still have the kavanah and the intention in that to say whatever whatever needs to be said. Okay, is that sort of clear to everybody? Okay, yes. now I want to just finalize with something that I left in the notes. Okay, and I'm going to end off with this today. It's in the notes. Um, I'm going to show you. I'm going to share it on the screen now. It's a, it's a, I took a photo of this one so I can pull it up for you. Uh, all right. Sorry. Here we go. Okay. Um, all right. So I did prepare this for you for today. 
Um, these are the pages for the Psuke de Zimra for Shabbat, which we didn't discuss yet, okay? And we will do it again in one of the other classes because we just focused on the ones for Shacharit and during the week. So you'll see that the ones in blue are the ones that we have, that we have um, not discussed. And the ones that are in black are just, the, I mean, they're just different pages than the other ones I gave you last, last week. But these are the pages during Shabbat, okay? So you can see, obviously, we still start with Baruch Shamar, and you can see at the end, we still end with Yishtabach. You also can see sort of Ashrei more or less in the middle there, like maybe two, two lines below the, the very blue section. You see that there's quite a lot that we've added in the middle. Um, and we also add um, the two sections at the end called the Nishmat and the Shochen Ad we add there on, on Shabbat, okay, at the end, at the bottom, before Yishtabach. Now, most of you that do go to Shul, if you do go to Shul, know that as far as the Shul davening is concerned now, nearly all Shuls start at Nishmat at the moment. They don't do the rest of the Pesuke de Zimra in Shul anymore. They start at Nishmat. And um, so, therefore, we, in other words, in the article on 400, and for those of you that are in the, um, uh, let me see, why can I see, can't see the page of the, what's, okay, hang on, I can see it. Okay, at 445 in the Koran, okay? So that's where they're starting at the moment in Shul, at the Nishmat, okay? So that's, if you do go to Shul. Um, so in other words, the rest of the Pesuket de Zimra, you really are at the moment saying at home, and therefore you can say at home if you have time. But again, remembering what I just told you a few minutes ago about if you are going to be going to shul and you're going to arrive there in time for nishmat, okay, whenever you know shul's going to start, and you don't have a lot of time at home before you leave to, to catch up and do some davening, then it's important to say the Baruch Shamar, the Ashrei, and the, and the Yishtabach you'll say in shul. You don't have to say that. So that you need to make sure you can say at, at least. And then otherwise, as I listed before, and you'll see in the notes, the other halalukas and the other prayers that we've spoken about. So um, I guess that ends the topic of um, Eric, what, what we said we would discuss this week. Um, uh, any questions? I have a mm -hmm. comment. Yes. Um, I, I just, you were talking about um, in um, Tehillim 150, Kol Hanishama to Halilka, and yeah. the, art, the art scroll has something that I think is very beautiful um, and the footnote says that um, more important to HaKadosh Baruch Hu than the most sublime instrumental songs of praise is the song of the human soul. And citing um, the commentator Radak says that Hashem's greatest praise is the neshama that utilizes its full potential in his service. And I just, think that's, I just think that's a very beautiful thought. Yeah, it is a very beautiful thought. And that, as you say, it's the, that's the whole concept of in the end of all those halalukas is focusing on the fact that it's the neshama in the end that glorifies Hashem and it's the neshama in the end that will live on and the neshama that stays even after you've lost someone dear to you, that person's neshama stays with you and, um, you know, and please God, as you say, it, it really is what glorifies Hashem and what does the mitzvot and everything like that. It's not, I mean, sometimes it's your body carrying out the mitzvah, but really it's your neshama that's mo motivating it. Thanks, Robin. That's great for sharing. Can I share something, Cheryl? Yes, of course, honey. Okay. I know we all believe that the Hash everything comes from Hashem, but one of the sentences in the ashray means so much to me, and it's Sadiq Hashem Asav, that we all know that everything comes from Hashem, but this says that where everything Hashem does is just, and he does everything with kindness. So for me, whenever something bad or something else that's not so good for me is going on, I tell myself that not only that he's in charge, but everything he does is just and it's with kindness. And it helps me feel much better instead of having a yo-yo going up and down. So right. I just wanted to share my dad with him. No, for sure. And I have to say, um, uh, last week, um, last week on Friday was the 50th yacht side of my late husband's um, mother, grandmother, and aunt who were killed in a terrible accident when an 18-wheeler went in the back of the car and they were on their way home from a Brit. And um, the, uh, the one aunt that survived the accident, she was actually the driver and managed, they managed to pull her out the car. 
she said while she and, and her, her father-in-law, that's my, my late husband's um, grandfather, were watching the car burn with the, you know, the other three people in the back of the car. She was like screaming and oh my God, like saying, oh God, oh God, like she was really screaming. And my, my, the, uh, my husband's grandfather said to her, he said, man kind, don't cry. He said, even this is the will of God. And, um, you know, everybody said that that was the whole thing that, that, that they'd learned from this grandfather on all the years that he survived afterwards and how he kept, he kept on this faith and this bitachon of trusting that Hashem, you know, is doing what Hashem is doing is right. And that even if it seems bad to you, if you can believe that, then that's just the most amazing, amazing thing to have and to get you through your life and through your troubles and your woes and everything that happens in, in your life. So thank you, honey, also for sharing that. So I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to end also because I know the rabbi is going to start in 10 minutes and I really give you a, a good pitch for his class because I'm going to be at that too. Um, just to remind you that next week, starting on November 9th, my topic will be good morning, good morning to you and you and you. And we talk <laughs> about the Brichot HaShacha, morning blessings, okay? Um, so that's what we will begin with 